Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 151, recorded May 12th, 2014. Rick Smolin. Triangulation is brought to you by LegalZoom. Visit LegalZoom.com to save on your legal needs and gain access to a network of legal plan attorneys for guidance. LegalZoom is not a law firm, but provides self-help services at your specific direction. Visit LegalZoom.com and use the offer code TRIANGULATION to receive $10 off at checkout. And by nature box where you can order great tasting healthy snacks delivered right to your door forget the vending machine and get in shape with healthy delicious treats like mango almond bites oh baby to get 50 percent off your first box go to naturebox.com slash twit that's naturebox.com slash twit it's time for triangulation the show where we bring in the most interesting people on the on the net the the most intelligent the most creative the most talented, and we get a chance to spend an hour with them, and I just, to me, it's it's candy. This is dessert at the beginning of uh, the week, and I'm really thrilled to bring back uh, somebody I've known for 20 years. Uh, he is one of my favorite photographers, but also one of my favorite book publishers, and very creative. Rick Smolin is with us, and uh, it's good to see you, Rick, from his office. Nice to be here, Leo. Thank you. Uh, against All Odds is his company, uh, but uh, you may remember him from The Great Day of the Life series he did the, the day in the life of cyberspace was something you'll never forget pictures taken in one 24-hour period all over the world um i th is i think this was one of your first books if not your first book from alice to ocean actually uh after we did the day in life books we then moved on and we did a book called the power to heal which is about how yeah. the human race is learning to heal itself and yeah. then this was the next book from alice to ocean from uh, this was an amazing story of a trek across the outback but all of your books are more than just picture books. I mean, there, there are beautiful images in them, but it's also uh, a story, and this one is a great oh, story. A story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, do you still get to take pictures, Rick, or is this, uh, is this now you're busy being a publisher? No, you know, I probably would have been voted least likely to be running a business when I was in high school and college. I could barely add up my ex expenses at the end of an assignment. Uh, so it's very ironic that I ended up running a uh, small you know, sort of, not even a publishing company. We were sort of a project group. The, we started out with this idea of looking at what a country was like on a, on a typical day. 24 that, hours, yeah. Yeah, or one a day in the life. A day in the life of, yeah, yeah. Australia. Yeah. Um, it was turned down by every publisher in the world who said, what a stupid idea. Oh. Um, uh, I w out of desperation, I went to the Prime Minister of Australia, where I was living in Australia at the time, and I said, I'm trying to do this book about your country. Uh, would you back it? Could the government you know, help me? And he said, you know, nice try. Uh, <laughs> he said, but w what I will do is he said, I'll give you a great idea. Boy, was this a great idea. He said, um, I'm going to introduce you to the CEOs of uh, Qantas Airlines, Kodak Australia, uh -huh. Hilton Australia, uh, to the guy that runs uh, Apple Australia, and I said, I'm trying to do a photo book about your country. Why would I want to talk to all these business people? And he said, okay, stick with me here, Rick. You're going to ask Qantas for free airline tickets, Kodak for film, this guy at Apple, Steve Jobs, you're going to ask him for free computers. And I said, and they're just going to give me this stuff for free? And <laughs> he said, yes, because you're going to put their logo in the front of your book. And I said, I can't do that. I'm a journalist. That would be immoral. It would be selling out. And he was sort of Okay, he said, Rick, it's like a PBS special. The following book is brought to you by. And it showed you how naive I was, Leo. It never occurred to me that having the prime minister actually setting up the meetings <laughs> would might have a little would weight. actually make a difference. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we, we raised no money. I couldn't pay the photographers. Really? But we had photographers from 30 countries. We had people sleeping in sleeping bags all over Australia. Um, couldn't find a publisher. I had to self publish the book. And A Day in the Life of Australia became the number one book in Australia with no publisher. Um, and it was sort of like having somebody hold a gun to my head saying, make this book a bestseller or you're going to jail. Uh, so I was highly motivated. I have no way of paying any of the bills. Um, and to everyone's astonishment in a country where 5,000 was the bestseller, we sold uh, 250,000 copies of A Day in Life of Australia. Um, and I thought I'd go back to being a photographer. Uh, but it was so successful that we started getting approached by the King of Spain's office called and said, um, yeah, we could do we, this in we, Spain, right? <laughs> we, we lost Disney to the French. We have this budget. Could you come and do us? Uh, Gorbachev called. The governor of uh, Hawaii called. 
So I never really went back to shooting after that. I, it, you know, we started, we did a book, then we did a book and a movie, then we did a book and a movie and an app and a website. And, right. Um, it just sort of kept expanding. And again, as you said at the beginning, um, it's all about storytelling. It's all this technology, all these photographers. It's not just taking generic pictures. It's trying to, to really tell the story of a country or now of an emerging topic like the global water crisis or uh, the world of big data. A day in the life of Australia was March 6th, 1981 was the day. And uh, I think it was also telling that you got all these incredible photographers to just say, hey, this is great, I'll do that. Uh, and, that it's a, and that really, that kind of also tells you you're onto something, because they loved the idea. Yeah, I mean, I said to the photographers, I'd have no money to pay you, but I can promise you'll have a great time. The Australians are really They're anxious wonderful. to welcome you to yeah. their country. I love Australians. And uh, we had you know, Sebastian Salgado. Uh, uh, I mean, so many of the, the people who are now the great photographers back in 1981, they were all, you know, kids getting started. Mm. They've, they've uh, these these became sort of the annual gathering of the tribe. You know, there were marriages, divorces, babies. You you name it. Get a hundred photographers together. You can imagine what goes on. Uh, we would bring them all to one place. They would have a few days to show their work to each other. We would brief them, give them film. Back in those days, we used film. Uh, send them out all over the country, and then they'd come back, and then we'd debrief them, interview them on tape. And so, one of the things we said to photographers, and you would appreciate this, Leo, is that. Uh, very, it's very seldom in your life as a photographer that someone says, here's the assignment. If you find something better, you can just scrap the assignment and come back with something else. <laughs> awesome. We, we said that to photographers, you know, we don't pretend to know everything, every aspect of life in Australia or Russia or Spain, but we're going to try to spread the photographers out geographically and thematically. But once you get out there, if you find something better, you can take a risk because it could be that we've assigned that same thing to somebody else. But so many of the best photographers, some of the best photographs in these books came out of that sort of sense of discovery and, and uh, a photographer's own initiative. I think if you honor photographers and trust them and let them go, they are, as a group, some of the most interesting, creative, talented artists I've ever met. Uh, very generous. Yeah, very generous. Very, and very generous, yeah. yeah. We were talking that, about that before the show began. Uh, you said you started uh, taking pictures as a, as a kid because it was a, because you were shy. Yeah, I was very shy. I mean, without the camera, it was like, you know, Superman loses his, <laughs> his powers. But you know, with, with a camera, I would hang out of airplanes, climbing on top. I mean, no fear of heights, nothing. <laughs> you know, you know ph photographers are always funny because it really gives you that feeling of not invulnerability, but there's this sense of mission to what you're doing. Um, and talking to strangers, talking to girls as a young kid, you know, it was, like, it was the way you could walk up to somebody and say, do you mind if I take your picture? And it was a conversation opener. It's, um, it's, it's I, I think, not uncommon. I think a lot of photographers I've met tell this kind of the same story. Um, but it's a license. Now, suddenly you have a license, not to kill, but to shoot. <laughs> well, to also sort of insert yourself in other people's lives in yeah. hopefully a gentle way. And I think, you know, one of the things that I found very early on working with all these other photographers is I would... I'm not a drinker, but basically all the photographers, when they weren't shooting, everybody would end up in a bar somewhere, right? right? So right. Um, I remember sitting around in Bangkok one day, and you know, again, I was about 10 years younger than most of the other photographers. And uh, you know, every time I went to these bars, all these photographers would sit around and bitch and moan about their editors and their damn publications. <laughs> and I said, guys, someone's paying us, you know, hundreds of dollars a day to see the world. They're paying all of our expenses, our pictures are, you know, showing up on the covers of Time magazine, and you guys are just like moaning and complaining. Yeah. Like, it's the story here. It's I felt like I pinched myself every day. This wasn't some drug-induced hallucination. <laughs> I was still back in college, and uh, I realized in talking to these men and women that the frustration was every one of us, them, uh, we all wanted our pictures to not just document what was going on, but to change it. We, we were hoping mm. that we'd shock people or, or show them pictures where people would say, "Well, that just can't go on. We can't allow that to happen." And I think a lot of us were very frustrated that so often our pictures were used to illustrate someone's preconceived ideas. Right. And so sitting in this bar with all these photographers, I said, wouldn't it be cool if we could all just get together and we would do our own book, just a group of photographers. And all my much older, wiser friends sort of patted me on the head and said, yeah, kid, you go organize it and let us know when it's ready, thinking that would be the end of that. Um, and that sort of turned into the day in life books. So it's fun. It's, you know, I think that's an interesting point is that uh, photographers are not passive observers. A lot of the times um, th there's a mission involved. I, you don't really think of that. You think of sometimes maybe photographers as voyeurs, but you're not necessarily. Also, you know, you think of things like the, the guy standing in front of Tiananmen Square stopping the tank with right. his hand. Right. I mean, no matter how many words you read, the, when you saw that picture, it sort of summed up this idea 
of, of an individual standing up against a society. The picture in Vietnam, Nick Ud's picture of the little girl running, you know, or sorry, Eddie Adams' picture of the, the street shooting in Saigon mm -hmm. with a little girl running with napalm. Mm -hmm. Those photographs changed the course of world politics, of world events, because people looked at them and were horrified or disturbed. And they, you couldn't look away. So, you know, great photographs have that power to actually maybe stop people in their tracks and say, okay, we can't allow this to happen anymore. Wow, it's a, it is, it's such a powerful medium. The image is so communicative. You know, uh, my friend Trey Ratcliffe, also a wonderful photographer, kind of the king of HDR, uh, yeah. told me the other day, he said, I think people, thanks to Instagram, the internet, uh, the rise of digital photography, I think kids are growing up more with a visual vocabulary in some cases than a verbal vocabulary. That, that like a visual literacy. A yeah. visual literacy. That's a very interesting idea. That's a big shift. It is. And what's funny about it, though, is you would think that uh, it would actually make people more appreciative of great photography. And I hope that's true. I know that so many of my friends in the prof professional photography world right now are struggling to make a living. Yes. And they weren't, you know, five or ten years ago. And it, it may just be that because everybody has a camera. It's commoditized. Value, it. yeah. yeah, that's right. Uh, the value of any individual photograph, unless you're Annie Leibovitz or, you know, somebody you know at the very top of the profession where you're as much buying their name and their reputation as their photographs although any is really extraordinary um it's really segmented itself into like there's this elite at the very top and then you've got a lot of people who are in the middle that used to make quite a bit of money that are now been sort of pushed mm -hmm. down this you know one dollar mm -hmm. i stock photographs right i stock photography is really you know it's 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 dampened it a lot and and at the same time i guess you know getty's now giving their pictures away for free right right uh, which is, you know, came as a huge shock to people. Um, it's an interesting idea. I mean, you, you, have you done shows about that? What's happening? With We've Getty? talked about that. Yeah, I mean, they, it's a little bit um, uh, of a. It's not exactly like you can just take that image and use it. You have to embed it in an iframe, in a, player. And, in yeah. a player, and stuff. So they they haven't exactly let the pictures free, but at the same time, I think they recognize that they were losing the picture. Their their Twitter accounts uh, where people are just taking them. So uh, yeah. the, they, they wanted to kind of, in some ways, this is a way of regaining control with the pictures. But I understand what you're saying. It must be more and more difficult. Uh, it's almost like if you had an infinite number of monkeys taking an infinite number of pictures, some of them would be Annie Leibovitz quality. Right. So, I mean, it's kind of fascinating. There's a couple of very interesting examples. There's a guy that, um, I forget his name, he's up in, uh, in Canada, and he actually goes through uh, Google Street View, and he drives up and down. Basically, he oh, goes yeah. all over the world visual and then he looks for frames and extracts them and then he blows them up and sells them in museums and he's sort of curating google street view and the pictures are wonderful they're just like something shot from by a world-class photojournalist so he didn't take the picture but he actually found it from this from the you know from these machines going up and down the, the street is it john raffman is that how you're yeah yeah john that's right yeah yeah yeah, yeah in fact, i mean we, i think we featured him in the human face of big data book it's it. This is a good, perfect. In fact, I have some. If you, I don't know if you can see these. Uh, yeah, there you go. Wow, that was fast. <laughs> these are Street View images. Yeah, incredible. And they're just and, and you know, but but I think that does also bring out one of the things that's really critical uh, to any photographer uh, is photo the ability to find to see a photo and get it and go, wow, that is a great picture. Um, and uh, oh, your, your team, I, I'm stunned at how fast your team got that up behind my you. My team, me, I did that. You, right, right. <laughs> oh, that's called the internet. It's the Leo yeah. clone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the big team of people. Um, th this is amazing stuff, uh, and it and it really looks like uh, art photography. Yeah, but it's just it, a car. He's able to actually extract it in very high resolution. It looks so good. Yeah, his prints look fantastic. He's doing something. I love it. It's such an interesting idea, that this idea that the picture's there, but you got to find the little needles in the haystack, yeah. right? But that's why a photo editor is such a skill. And that's kind of really the part of the skill of what you have is, is looking at these images and saying, yeah, that's the one. And that is an art in itself. That is really a talent. It, it, it's funny, Leo, because, you know, over the years, people have tried copying these products that we've done. And I'm perfectly happy with, for people to, you know, get, I mean, I, I don't own this concept. I mean, I didn't even originate it. Life magazine did a one day in the life of America in 1974 that I worked on as like a, as a kid. Uh, but what's interesting to me is a lot of other people have hired the exact same photographers that we've sent out and done books and the books, you know, to be honest, are pretty mediocre. And I, I don't think it's the photographers. I think it's the picture editor. Yes. I think you're right. That, 
there was a guy who would do these projects and he, he would have his wife edit the pictures and she wasn't a professional picture editor. And I'm sure there were great pictures. I know these photographers. There's no way you could send some of these people out and not have great pictures. But you look in the book and go, wow, that's the best that photographer did. So it's really, it's a combination of great photography, great editing, um, and great pre reproduction. And we have somebody that lives on press when we do these books. I should, again, say that it started out as books, but now we're telling these stories. We won the... Uh, the Webby for uh, uh, Best Educational iPad app last year for this Human Face of Big Data book, which, again, is a topic you wouldn't think you could photograph. It sounds so cold. It and, sounds abstract, you know, yeah. It doesn't sound like, what would you photograph? And yet right. people just love the book. This is an amazing book, and we'll, uh, I def we'll talk about it in just a second. Uh, Rick Smolin is our guest. Against All Odds Productions, since 1981, he's been producing some of the most interesting uh, photography in the world. Um, you did Australia, you did Spain, you did Africa. How many how in uh, how many books did you end up doing on that series? I think we did sixteen on the first <laughs> wow. series. Wow. I, I actually left after I think the first twelve. My <laughs> wife stayed on Jennifer Irwitt, whose dad is Elliot Irwitt. I don't know if you know his work, but he's one of the all time great photojournalists. Uh, and then she she did Italy, Ireland, I can't remember all the but China. Um, and, and my partner David Cohen, they they did these projects together, and then we sort of moved on and started doing deep deep dives on emerging topics instead of just countries on a day. Right. Elliot um, was a magnum photographer. Are those yeah. agencies still uh, important? You know, Getty kind of snatched up and, and ate a lot of them. And, and Getty does really interesting work. I know Jonathan Klein is the CEO, and I actually talked to him about this new data initiative, this new idea of giving the pictures away, because as you said before. People were stealing them anyway, so right. it's a very clever idea. They're basically saying you can use our pictures if you're a nonprofit. They even include media as nonprofit, which is probably ironic. <laughs> uh, but uh, in return, they are, you give them the right to collect data about who's coming to your website. Oh, isn't that from. interesting? So they are getting yeah, paid. Well, they are, and what's interesting is they reserve the right to turn advertising on. So for now, the pictures are free. They uh. appeared on your you know, on your your website or your blog or whatever, but Anytime they want to, maybe after there's hundreds of millions of embeds or billions, on one morning they can turn on and be advertising the Leo Laporte show. Wow. Right? And what's fascinating about that is that they're going to share the revenue with the photographers. Oh, good. I said, are you, are you screwing the photographers? I mean, are you giving my pictures away for free and then you're going, to sell, you're going to sell the data? And they said, no, no, actually, we're going to give the photographers the same cut that they would have gotten if, if someone had bought the picture, which is incredibly honorable. Yeah, Very no impressive. kidding. Because they, they don't have to do that, I guess. They don't. And Jonathan actually, to my great pleasure, loves photography and, and photographers. And so often, you know, these, these companies get bought and sold and it's just middlemen and nobody actually yeah. cares about the product anymore. Yeah. I, I'm pretty impressed with him as a and Mark Getty also who you know, whose name is on the company. They started it together. And I was also sort of prepared to not like Mark when I met him the first time. <laughs> and uh, he was on on a stage at a conference I was at and he spoke so eloquently about the power of photography and the the place it, it plays today in our lives and in, to, in our ability to understand where our, our species has come from and hopefully where we're going. Uh, we're we're going to take a break. We'll come back. We'll talk about the book of big data. We'll talk about a lot more. Rick Smolin is our guest and wonderful uh, guy and photographer. And actually, I first met you when you were doing uh, CD-ROMs of, right. of, right. of the books. <laughs> that's, how, that's how long I've known you. CD-ROMs! Yeah. Our show today brought to you <laughs> by LegalZoom.com. It's not a law firm. Oh, no, it's much better. LegalZoom lets you start a business, lets you take care of your family, lets you do legal work that you don't really need a law firm uh, for, just uh, a good company that can help you walk through step-by-step the process you need to incorporate to create an LLC, it's ninety nine dollars to, to create it. That's what we did back in two thousand five when I founded Twid. Uh, I, I didn't couldn't afford a law firm; it was just me. So amazing, legal zoom ninety nine dollars, state filing fees. And by the way, don't tell our law firm, which we now have, we're still using that LLC, those papers from the uh, from way back when. They work fine. Chapter S, Chapter C, you can do that too. LegalZoom uh, is a way to uh, start your own business, to get the trademarks you need, the, the, the incorporation you need. But it's also a way to protect your family, a last will and testament, $69. Um, these things are really important to do. And, and, and maybe the idea of going to a lawyer and pen, spending a lot of money is put, put, put you, uh, um, make, make you put it off. And don't, because, you know, a health care power of attorney, uh, so important. A will, so important. Uh, trademarking your stuff. That's not something you want to put off. Do it now. 
LegalZoom.com. If you uh, visit them, you can also get help from an attorney. Yeah, this is an interesting... They didn't have this, and I, I kind of wish that I had uh, used this feature when I, I set up the LLC. One of the questions I had, LLC or Chapter C or Chapter S, what, what kind of corporation? Where do you incorporate? What state? If you want advice, you can get uh, legal advice from an experienced attorney in your state. They've pre selected them and negotiated a low monthly fee so you're not going to get this massive bill uh, you can look at the reviews the profiles and and choose the attorney that's right for you so you can get that done as well it is all very affordable it really is uh, empowering and i want you to check it out legalzoom.com if you decide that you want to take advantage of one of their services you take ten dollars off if you just tell them they heard it on triangulation use the code triangulation in the offer code section as you check out legalzoom Dot com. Not a law firm. There's something better. Self-help services at your direction, plus legal advice when you need it. LegalZoom.com. Our guest, Rick Smolin, uh, just one of my favorite people. I really enjoy talking to Rick every Thank time. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's so nice to see you again. Uh, I was really thrilled when this came in the mail. Actually, you know what? Before we talk about the big, the human face of big data, I want to talk about America at Home, because that's another interesting project you recently did. Uh, and that's kind of when I got, I said, oh, Rick's still doing books. This was a really neat idea. This was pictures of people at home. And what yeah. an amazing, uh, how we live. This was a great way, I think, to create people. Uh, I mean, to, to give people a chance to get what's going on, to connect people, to see what other people, how other people live, and to reconnect us in a society that seems to have fragmented it a little bit. Um, it was so personal. So funny, Leah, what, what you're seeing behind you there on the screen is really fascinating. That it was a it was a New York Times bestseller, but what was interesting is uh, after we did this project, we had uh, we had hundred photographers went around the United States for a week from all over the world, but we also opened it up to the public. So during the week, you could basically take an assignment from our right. website, shoot pictures, submit them, and we <laughs> included a lot of pictures from oh, the public neat. from other professional photographers. But what you're seeing on the screen is you could actually upload your own picture after the book was finished, and when your book arrived, your wedding, your family, it was your, your cover. cover. And people just love it. I did that. This. It was so I, yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, they can't do that good. anymore, unfortunately. But uh, no, I mean the website. It, can't it, do that it was, forever. It was quite complicated, but it worked. Yeah. People loved it. Um, and uh, as you I think, one of the quotes there is Oprah Winfrey uh, had featured uh, our previous book, uh, which was uh, America Twenty Four Seven, because of that custom cover feature. Yeah. Which was, you know, very. You know, we had tried to get to Oprah because, you know, getting on Oprah is like oh, going, yeah. died and going to heaven in the yeah. publishing world. Yeah. And she found it herself in a bookstore one day, oh, which that's is so neat. just thrilling. That great. must, I, the technical challenge of doing that is kind of mind boggling. Well, you want to hear a funny story? Uh, when I was, I gave a speech in, in San Francisco to high school, I don't know, 15 years ago. And this young kid came up to me afterwards with a box of Kodak prints and with his mom, and he showed me his pictures, and they were, you know, nice pictures. And he called me a few days later and said, could I intern for you this summer? You know, I'll work for free. I'll run errands. I'll clean the office. I just want to be a photographer. I want to be around oh, you. And reminded me of myself when I was that age. So his yeah. mother would drive him over twice a week. And uh, he worked for us for a few summers. Then he went to Stanford to graduate at the top of his class. Uh, and when we were doing this uh, America 24-7 project, he came to work for us. And one day, my daughter was like three years old at the time. And he came in and said, do you have any pictures of your daughter? And I said, yeah, why? And he said, just give me one of the pictures of your daughter. And he came in the next day and he had this replacement wraparound <laughs> cover. And he said, I've written the software. I found the vendors. I mean, he'd, worked, he'd run the systems, the, the wow. money collection. 23 years old. And two weeks ago, he won the Pulitzer Prize in photography. <gasps> uh, Josh Hainer is his <gasps> name. And um, you can imagine he called me and I was like, oh, my God. You know, I feel like the proud father, right? Just the sweetest guy. And uh, he went on from, you know, from working on America 24-7. Fortune hired him. And then the New York Times hired him, and he did this incredibly powerful story about this young guy who uh, lost his legs in the Boston Marathon bombing last year and basically kind of just became really close friends with this guy and lived with him and told the story in such a poignant way. Um, anyway, just sort of one of those. So the custom covers have a, uh, you know, a connection to today in a, in a very kind of odd way. That is an amazing story. I mean, he got a Pulitzer for that's, you picked somebody. Uh, it must have been something you saw in that guy, a spark. Well, vice versa. I mean, I just we were so lucky to have Josh. That's I mean, he so you know he made that book, and again because of him, Oprah you know chose it and became a New York Times bestseller. Yeah. So yeah, you never know who's doing who a favor. These yeah, days, you know? yeah. Well, again, it it strikes me it's 
the community of photographers is just an amazing community. So let's talk about big data. What got you? First of all, exactly, there's no, what does the picture of big data look like? I mean, what made you think you could do a photo book on big data? Yeah, Leo, I go to TED every year. And yeah. I, I love TED, and I've been going since, I think I've been to every single one except the second TED, or the first TED when it first started. And, uh, you know, it's so great because you've got incredibly smart people whose currency is their intelligence, their ideas. Right. Nobody cares how much money you made or, were, or anything. They, they care about who's got the new ideas. And uh, Marissa Meyer, who's an old friend, uh, has helped us on many of our products when she was at Google. And about two years ago, I ran into her TED, and she said, what's your new project? And I said, I don't know. We're looking for something to do, but nothing sort of gets me going. And she said, you know, have you thought about doing a project about big data? And I said, what's that? And it sounded like one of those marketing phrases. Everybody's attaching yeah. the word. Yeah, what does that mean? Right. Like this, the cloud of big right. data. You know? right. She said, a lot of us in the technology world think we're witnessing the planet developing a nervous system. I said, wait a second, say that again. And she said, a lot of us believe that the amount of data being collected, we're all walk, we're all, we've all become human sensors. All these, you know, our, our smart devices, right? right? Everybody's now walking around constantly, not only getting information, but transmitting information, where I am, how long I've been there, who I've talked to, what I've bought, what I've searched for. And that there's this sort of real-time feedback loop that we've never had before as a species. And it's starting to affect health and commerce and, and uh, photography. I mean, radio, every single aspect of life on Earth is starting to change by this collection of data. And my 11-year-old walked into the kitchen one night when I was working on this project. And I've been interviewing people for about six months again, trying to get a handle on it. And he said, Dad, every time you're on the phone, you always keep saying this word, big data, big data. What does that mean? <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, my God, 11 years old, it's like 2 in the morning. How do I explain this to him? And I'm still trying to figure it out myself. And I said, Jesse, um, imagine your whole life you've been looking through one eye, and all of a sudden scientists enabled you to open up a second eye. So what you're getting is not just more vision. You have a different dimension. You can see things in three dimensions. And, of course, you know, being 11 years old, he said, Dad, so could I open up a third eye and a fourth and a thousand eyes? You know, And if you're 11 years old, a thousand eyes is really cool. And I said, that's exactly what's happening. We're able to take different perspectives on things from a thousand different points of view and overlap them and see depth and patterns in there we can never see before. I love that picture of the baby you were just And showing. everybody's taking a picture of this baby with their camera phones and their cameras and even even his big sister. <laughs> it's yeah, I mean, like, literally, like, the first day of a baby's life now, you know, I think there's a quote you had there a little, a minute ago, like, The amount today, of data generated by humanity in the first day of a baby's life is equivalent to 70 times the information contained in the Library of Congress. Right. And the page before is even more astounding. Oh, than yeah. We're we are exposed to as much data in one day as our ancestors from the 15th century were exposed to in their entire life. Holy cow. You think, well, really? And then you think, well, think about Europe for a second. You know, be, uh, the driving from Germany to France is like driving from Pennsylvania to Philadelphia. Yeah. And yet, different culture, food, customs, language, which tells you how little people traveled, how little how little people were exposed to because everything was so confined. And now I think, you know, uh, when I think of my children, they don't know a world where you couldn't pick up the uh, Skype and talk to somebody on the other side of the world in a second or, or tweet some grown up. The it's, it's, they've grown up in such a different world. Than we did. Yeah. Remember when your parents used to say it's a long distance call, you've only got like 10 right, seconds right. to of your grandma? I'm on long distance. <laughs> it doesn't we matter a, anymore. We had a wonderful uh, nanny uh, from uh, from Bangladesh, really one a woman who became part of our family, and she was living next to our house in Mill Valley in our cottage. And I walked in one day, and I knocked on the door, and she said, come in. And, and I heard her talking to somebody. I said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize somebody else was here. And she said, no, I'm talking to my husband. And I said, your husband? And she says, oh, he's in Bangladesh. She said, I hope you don't mind. I leave Skype open 24 hours a day. Uh, so we have we have breakfast together and dinner together. Oh, wow. And it, it never occurred to me. I mean, it doesn't cost anything, right? So basically, they would leave their Skype connections open in two sides of the world. And even though they were separate, they would talk. They'd watch TV together. I mean, it was really one of those, like, I'd never thought of that. That idea of always on. Always, right? always there. Connected. Telepresence, yeah. Amazing. Just you know, incredible. What a different world. What a world. You know? I love yeah. this picture of Brewster Kale and his very strange collection yeah. of uh, statues of people. Uh, so one of the things, if you show your uh, your uh, uh, viewers and listeners, in the bottom left hand side of that page is a little key. It's a little, uh, yeah, a little yellow key. And what that means is there's a free app that we have. It's the Human Face Big Data Viewer app, and you can point your smartphone at that photograph, and Brewster appears on your smartphone and tells you his story. Oh. So what a great book, idea. It's like Harry Potter. You get to touch on the people it in the comes photograph. Alive. And they tell you. So 
I, again, you know, as you know, Leo, I love technology as it helps storytelling. And I thought, what a wonderful, cool way of connecting uh, the 500-year-old medium of the book to the yeah. internet. Yeah. So you can, if you're interested in this person, you can learn more than what we can fit into on the pages of the book. Holy. This is technology from HP called Erasma, which is wonderful. I love it. I don't think it's really been used for this. Usually, they use it for little 3D dancing sprites and advertisements. But um, <laughs> there's, there's a connection to that. To the new, uh, we're doing a new book right now uh, about this camel trip story that we're going to talk about in a minute, where you can point at the original photographs of Robin's camel trip, and then you see how Mia Wasikowska or Adam Driver in the movie uh, played that that scene out, which is pretty fun. Wow, really neat stuff. Um, uh, this 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 when I got this book, I I just kind of poured through it, and I I think in some ways it's more than a photo book. It's actually I'm trying to download the app here as we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I think. <laughs> uh, I'm actually, uh, it's an instructional book. Uh, this is something like kids should read to understand what's going on. I just love there's it. Some med- there's some medical stories in here that are just uh, absolutely amazing. There's a guy, um, Francis Collins, who's the head of the National Institute for Health. I heard him speaking at a, at a mm-hmm. workshop. And he was talking about the fact that um, large pharmaceutical companies uh, create uh, you know, they're trying to create cures for the biggest problems facing humanity. And often when they get a human clinical trial, they find out that this new drug, while it might help 99.9% of people take it, you know, 0.001% will be harmed. So they can never really say, right? So he said that when Steve Jobs was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer five years ago, uh, it cost $100,000 to sequence his DNA, and today it costs 1000 Wow. Francis Collins said he believes in five years it'll cost fifty dollars. It'll be like getting a flu shot, <laughs> and that no no doctor will be able to prescribe any drug, not even an aspirin, unless they first look at your DNA, right? And he said what's incredible about this is if all of these cures for human diseases have already the, the hundreds of millions, billions of dollars have been spent, but these drugs were not approved. They're sitting on the shelves of these drug companies. If suddenly through being able to sequence your DNA for $40, they can say, Leo, this drug would cure you, but Rick, this would kill you. Suddenly, all these drugs can actually be put to work. That's incredible. What a, what a cool story, right? Here's, I love this idea of using data this way. It's fabulous. Here's the, uh, can you see this, Chad? Okay, so I got the app, and here, and then you, and you get it, and then you get Brewster Kale. You point it, you point it at this picture, and somehow the app knows and launches the TED Talk. Amazing. Exactly. There's nothing in There's not a QR code or anything. It just recognized it. It learns the picture. Holy cow! Amazing. I didn't even. You know, I know. I I noticed that, and I didn't do anything about it. Now I'm going to reread the whole book. Sorry, I mean, it's funny because I've had friends that then got to the book just looking for the little keys. Yeah. You know, especially the kids. You know. Yeah. Now the book. The, the book is like the perfect gift to somebody who. Uh, is a geek or is curious about how our world's about to change, I think that big data is going to have a thousand times bigger effect on our lives than even the internet. And that's saying a lot. I mean, think about 20 years ago, how the internet, it just, I mean, nobody, it, it's still mind boggling to think this is only 20 years old, this whole internet revolution. When um, I was a kid, there was a, a Time Life book, a uh, picture book. It was the Something of Man. The um, Do you remember that book I'm talking about? And, and I perused it nonstop constant. Oh, we did we lose we're calling I'm Rich back. back. I'm back. You got it. Um, what was the book? Remember there was a, a time life book was something the something of man, the the the, the life the family of man. Family of man. Yeah. As a kid, I went through I just looked at that though. I loved Life magazine too. And yeah. I never stopped yeah. looking. And I feel like this is the family of man for the, for the new generation. Yeah. Because I think a kid perusing this every time they go through this would learn something and would get a better understanding of the world that they're entering, and I think that's important. You know, you know it's so funny. My uh, 11, my son's 11, you know, my son's in fifth grade, and his uh, teacher, we gave her one of these books for the classroom, and she said the kids just I can't keep them away from this book. They just keep pouring over it. Then I got an email from Jack Dorsey at Twitter saying I love this book. I yeah. give it out to everybody that's asking me how the world's about to change. So the fact it's going from my fifth grade teacher, you know, son's fifth grade teacher to the head of Twitter uh, or Square. I love that it sort of spans that whole gap. There's something in here for everybody, basically. I just looked up The Family of Man. It was, it was uh, Edward Steichen's uh, right. exhibition, uh, exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in 1955. And in a way, it was kind of what, in an exhibit, what you do in your books. It was 503 photos, 68 countries, 273 photographers, including, you know, some very famous photos like Dorothea Lange's uh, migrant uh, mother uh, photo, 
and and uh, and then they made it into a book and I to me this probably was a formative book to, to look at and I feel like this kind of is the same it was thing. for me too yeah Do you remember the picture of there's a woman pregnant on a bed with a cat yeah in front of her that's my mother-in-law that's, what uh, Jen- that's my wife's mother so, so, so Elliot one of Elliot's pictures was in that exhibit oh he had a, he had several pictures in there yeah it's great it's I mean, just I, come I got, full I got circle that when I was a kid. yeah, yeah. I wonder, can you get the book still? Sure, you can get anything on Amazon That's or right. Libras. <laughs> <laughs> it's all available. And actually, I'm just trying to see if some of... It looks like there may be an online uh, version of The Family of Man. They tried doing A Family of Women. It wasn't nearly as successful. Yeah. Um, uh, but that, that book was, you know, again, it was before television. And it was, it was sort of, it, it gave everybody, a, it, it sort of... It allowed you to see parts of the world that you had never seen before. I think that was part of the fascination. People kind of right. peering through other people's windows. Well, and know? that's kind of what I feel about with your all of your books. It's a window into people, but and I was trying to express this, and I didn't do it very well. It can, reconnects us. It reminds us we are a family. And that whether you're in Australia or Africa or anywhere in the world, uh, that, that really we're all human and that we have this connection. And your books do such a good job of uh, communicating that. It's one of the reasons. Oh, thank you. It's amazing to actually make a living doing something you love doing that. Much. I'm sure you're the same thing. It's like we oh, both yeah. do something that oh, we yeah. love. Oh, yeah. Um, all right, we're going to move on again yeah, because I want to hear about the new project uh, in just yeah. a bit. Rick Smolin is uh, our guest, and uh, he is, uh, I guess if you go to againstallodds.com, is that the best place to go to find yeah. out what, oh. you're, what you're doing? There's so many, so many projects. You are one of the most energetic. How old were you when you first started working as a photographer? Um... I was hired by Time when I was 24. 24. Um, there was a there was a guy there named John Derniak that would hire photographers and throw them out in the middle of the lake to see if they would sink or swim. <laughs> I didn't know this, so he was always used, looking for young, hungry photographers who would do anything, and I I didn't care what it was. Give me you know send me anywhere, I'll do any assignment. I had no sense of oh it's beneath me or something like that because no matter what it was, it always lead to something else. Right. Um, and one of the a, a friend of mine, uh, he was asking me before at the photo agencies, Magnum is still. A very uh, uh, you know famous and well respected agency. Most of the other agencies have kind of dried up now at yep. this point. Yep. Magnum was always the great, you know, Cartier Bresson and Elliott and other people like that. Uh, but um, as a young photographer, uh, I was one of my friends had the first non. He was given a ticket on the first nonstop Pan Am flight from New York to Tokyo, and no one wanted to go because it was one of these stupid press junkets where you get on a plane, fly to Tokyo, photograph two guys shaking hands, get back on the plane, and fly home. And it's like, I'll go. I've never been to Japan. I came back 11 months later. I was supposed to leave on Monday, come back on Thursday. And it's like, I got to Japan. It's like, wow, this is so cool. So I started, you know, I made up my own projects. Time heard I was there and sent me to photograph the prime minister of Australia. That's how I met him. Wow. He invited me back to Australia. The government had a program where they brought journalists there. Um, it was Doors just, opened. You know, Everything just kept opening, yeah. And, and here, so, by the way, is uh, I found it, the uh, Elliot Erwitt. Uh, yeah, there it is. Talking about. I, yep. you know, every, any time I see a picture from that family of man, it resonates so deeply with me. Be, I mean, I stared at these images for years. That's my sister-in-law in the bed there. That's amazing. <laughs> it, and ha- the baby. Yeah, that's Ellen. Yep. <laughs> that's... She's actually staying right next door to me right here with her, with her, with her son who's at NYU Film School. Well, right I hope here. she yeah. forgives me showing her bottom. <laughs> on I think the she's air. Used to it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have more with Rick in just a little bit. Our show today brought to you by Nature Box. It comes to that time of day, you know, where you want to you just like a little peckish. You don't want a full meal. Yeah, and you, what right. do you do? You go to the back of the, you know, the office and there's the candy machine and you eat something crappy for you. But instead, what we've started to do is we've got these Nature Boxes. They come, um, you can have them every month. There are three different sizes. If you go to naturebox.com, you can find out. Uh, more about it. And these are healthy snacks, uh, nutritionist approved. They never have high fructose corn syrup, trans fats. Um, you can get Nature Box snacks in a variety of, for a variety of dietary needs, vegan, gluten free, uh, all sorts of uh, stuff. If you go to the website, you'll see you can choose spicy, sweet, or savory, or you can mix and match. Uh, my suggestion is get a box. By the way, do you like that? Uh, your, the spring sale, take advantage of that too. You can get a box. Mm-hmm because you can add a, a snacks to your box for just a buck so you can really try them. Get a variety because you won't believe the variety and they are so good. Come on. Go to naturebox.com slash twit. You know you want to. Choose a subscription. Choose the, the type of snacks. Lactose-free, nut-free, non-GMO, savory, sweet, or spicy. And they'll ship it right to your door for free anywhere in the U.S. How about banana bread granola? 
How about peppery pistachios? You know what we've been eating a lot of? The pineapple rings, the dried pineapple in here is phenomenal. I think they're all gone. I was just looking to see if there's one here. I think they're all gone because we've been eating them. They're so good. Mango almond bites. Nature Box. Go to naturebox.com slash twit. If you use the offer code twit, you'll get half off your first box. And then take advantage of that special spring sale. You can add a variety of snacks for just a dollar to your Nature Box. Naturebox.com slash twit. Snacks are good. Good snacks are good anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Rick Smolin is our guest, one of the most interesting photographers. He worked for Time. He worked for National Geographic. He, uh, But is best known, I think, for the Day in the Life books, a series that was just uh, mind-boggling starting in the early 80s. Um, this was uh, one of the books that uh, I think might have been one of the first books of yours that I read from Alice to Ocean. What's the story behind this? Well, when I was 27, I was sent by Time to do a, a cover story in Aborigines. And uh, I walked out of my hotel room. Uh, there was a woman I was supposed to meet down the street who had worked with a writer already. And I walked out of my hotel, and the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen in my life was washing the windows of my hotel. <laughs> and I, had, you know, I was 27 years old, three cameras around my neck, beautiful girl. <laughs> what um, are you going to so do? I, Take a picture? I, I took some pictures, right? <laughs> and she got really angry and told me where I could put my cameras. And uh, uh, so I apologized, which didn't seem to calm her down very much. So I left and I went down the street, met the woman who was going to take me into the Aboriginal camps, spent the day shooting, you know, got permission from the elders to take pictures. And at the end of the day, she said, you know, the woman working for me said, what are you doing tonight for dinner? And I said, I'm going to go back and work on captions in my hotel room. And she said, well, a group of us that work with Aborigines are getting together at a friend's house and you know, might, you might be interested in meeting some of them. They can give you some ideas about the things you might want to shoot while you're here in Alice Springs. So I said, sure, it sounds great. So I got this address and I drove to the outside of town and I showed up this sort of abandoned looking building with the walls falling down. There was no roof on this building. I thought this couldn't possibly be the right address, but I kind of timidly knocked on the door. And of course, who opens the door but the woman had been washing the windows of my hotel who was not happy to see You're me. You're stalking uh, me. <laughs> yeah, it's like, put the damn cameras down. You can't photograph my friend. So I said, okay. I went inside and found the woman working for me, and I said, you know, what's with your friend? And while we're talking, I said, look at the backyard, and this woman has camels in her backyard tied up. So I said to her, why do you have camels? And she said, it's none of your business. So I went back to my friend and said, why does your friend have camels? And she said, well, she's got this crazy idea to walk from here, Alice Springs, uh, 2,000 miles through the outback of Australia, uh, out to the Indian Ocean. And I said, why? And she said, none of us know. Robin's this odd girl that showed up here a year ago. Uh, we worry about her. We bring her food. We come out and visit with her. And we, we're afraid she's going to die out there. Uh, she won't let us come. I said, wow, that's pretty crazy. And then the, at the end of the week, it was the day came for me to leave. And uh, the woman working for me came up and said, Robin wants to ask you a favor, but she's been so unpleasant to you. Uh, she's a little embarrassed to ask you. I said, I couldn't imagine what's the favor. And she said, well... Robin wrote to National Geographic a year ago, and they never answered. And she wondered if maybe you knew somebody there or she could use your name. So I said, well, I've met some of the editors at workshops. I've never worked for them. And sure, she can use my name for what it's worth. So I go back to the States, and I'm home for about a week, and the phone rings, and it's the editor of National Geographic. And the guy says, um, we got this letter from this very interesting woman in Australia. We're thinking of funding her trip. But is she going to die out there? Is she a nutcase? Is she serious? I said, no, she's very intense and I've seen her camels and her dogs and and uh, her maps and he said well since you guys are such good friends would you like to be the photographer that we sent to accompany her on and off you have to find her four or five times during the nine month trip so uh, Leo was the most interesting year of my life this woman was so intense so fascinating um, so complex it was like it was like being with five different people yeah. I was never quite sure who I was traveling with yeah um, she had really mixed thoughts about the moment she got the money from the geographic, she immediately hated me because right. she felt she sold her soul to the devil. And right. it's like, wait, you asked me for a favor and now you're angry at me because I got <laughs> the funding. Um, so it was a very, it's a wonderful story. And um, uh, she wrote a book about it years later after saying she would never write a book about it. Um, and she was attacked by wild camels. She got lost. She ran out of water. Um, my biggest fear is that she would die out there. Every time I left her, I thought this might be the last time I would ever see her. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a wasteland. Yeah, there's nothing out there. It's just, you know, for a few Aboriginal you know, encampments. But it's so easy to get lost. I mean, if the camels had run away, she'd be dead. If, if right. one of the camels threw her and she broke a leg, she'd be dead. If she right. took the wrong path and there was no water, she'd be dead. Plus, there's crazy people out there. 
<laughs> I mean, there's no law. There's no. It's like the Wild right. West. If somebody you know finds you out there, you know, there's nobody. To, there's no police to go to for help. Right. Um, and she did this trip, and uh, she wrote this amazing book called Tracks, which has sold a million copies in 18 languages. And for years, Hollywood's been trying to figure out how to turn it into a, a movie. It was going to be Diane Keaton tried buying the rights first, then, then it was Julia Roberts, then it was Helen Hunt, then it was Nicole Kidman about five years ago. And they've just finished the movie now. It's called Tracks. And uh, Mia Wasikowska, this wonderful young Australian actress who looks so much like I've Robin. Got, it's eerie. I've got some pictures, actually, of them. Oh, you uh, do? Yeah. You could show those. Yeah, there they are. On yeah, set. Yeah, there. Yep. Yeah. And Robin still looks gorgeous. And Mia and she have become really good friends. And they stayed pretty true to what happened, uh, you know, on the trip. Um, it was really eerie because they actually, at one point, I, I went down to Australia during the shoot, and they'd actually manufactured the same clothes that were in my photographs to put on <laughs> Mia and, and uh, Adam Driver. That's That was the record. Yeah. So I looked at this and I thought, is this the is this one of Rick's pictures or this is from the movie? This is Mia. Which one? Yes, yeah, that's Mia. Yeah. But you would never know. No, no, they look like the same person. It looks like the same person. So there's there's Mia, Robin. What, what's so funny, if you've seen Mia in any other movies, this doesn't look like the Mia that you right. saw in uh, Alice in Wonderland with Johnny Depp. Right. Or Stoker with Nicole Kidman last year. Right. She is a chameleon. She totally changes and morphs into each character. And there's Adam Driver. Playing it's Rick Smolin. <laughs> but you know what? That's so, good casting. <laughs> it, it's pretty funny. He's taller than me. Uh, he, he, he told me that he can't grow facial hair, so they actually had to glue on the beard every day. Uh, he's a wonderful... He just got cast as the new bad guy in Star, I Star Wars. I saw that, yeah. He's and a uh, uh, actor. Martin Scorsese just cast him in Silence last week. He's suddenly hot, hot, hot. He wow. was in, he's in yeah. Girls, and uh, was great in Girls. Is yeah, it's very funny. Yeah, uh, and I'm thrilled to see that they cast him for play. Now, does he have a big role? Is it? Are you a big part of this movie? Um, I'm sort of the pest at the beginning of the movie. I'm the annoying guy that you know is already <laughs> bugging her, and then by the end of the movie, I, I turn into a good guy. It's better than the other direction, I guess, the trajectory. <laughs> and what um, is that? The actual camera you use? What is the camera? Yeah. It's a Nikon, uh, Nikromat EL, I think. I have oh. a Nikon, and I, I'm an old Nikon guy. I love it that they. I mean, that's a vintage camera. No, it's, they wanted exactly... That's the same car I drove back then. It was a Toyota uh, Land Cruiser. Wow. Uh, and um, they were just amazing how accurate they wanted to be. There's Robin today so on the set. And Rick. It was really fun. Robin and I have remained really good friends over all these years, but it was fun. It was very surreal, as you can imagine, to watch these two young people playing us uh, almost 37 years ago. Wow. Wow. Uh, and um, it, the outback hasn't changed. I mean, it literally, yeah. my pictures from almost 40 years ago look like they were shot yesterday. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a tiny bit of romance in the movie, but most of it is about their friendship. That's really neat. That's really yeah. really neat. Um, it's, a, it's coming out. It's coming out here on September 29th. Is it going to be called oh, sorry, Tracks? What's it? It's called, it's called Tracks, and um, it was just a hit of the Venice Telluride and Toronto Film Festival. And uh, the Weinstein Company, you know, that uh, picked it up. It's actually the movie's been made by Seesaw Films, the guys that did the King's Speech. So if you saw that movie, loved that movie. It's wonderful. They, they, you know, I haven't really been around Hollywood very much, but these people were so dedicated and so sincere and so. Uh, obviously, they have to make a movie that's entertaining, but they right. were trying to make this as, uh, you know, when you read about James Cameron taking the moldings of the Titanic right. and building the. I mean, who would know? Who would care? Right. And when I showed up on the set, they said, we've taken your photographs, basically, and created many of the sets. And it was like walking into my own still photographs. Some of it was just so... That's mind-boggling. It was hard to believe. It was hard to comprehend. For a photographer, you can imagine how strange that must have felt. Mind-blowing. Yeah. And are they going to re-release, or are you going to re-release really Alice to Ocean? Because... It's funny. I'm doing a new book right now called Inside Tracks, which is, instead of it being a tall vertical book, it's a hard horizontal book. The first half of it is uh, images, some of the best pictures from Robin's original journey. The second half is there was an amazing photographer named Matt Nedheim, who was this, the set, the stills photographer on the set, who, who's a great journalist. I mean, his pictures do not look anything like the usual boring, you know, movie set photographs. And then Mandy Walker, who's a cinematographer, um, they gave, the filmmakers gave me permission to go in and actually extract frames. She shot on film, it was anamorphic Panavision. I sound like I know what I'm talking about. It's, it's basically <laughs> good, the bad, and the ugly. It's very, very large, long format. So I'm able to extract scenes you're seeing there behind you as if they are still photographs. So the second half of the book is telling the story of the movie wow. with the screen. 
It's really fun. Here's the original photo. Here's the recreated set. Wow. And again, the same thing with Erasmus. So you can point your, there's going to be a, an app that you can point at the okay. original photograph of Robin writing the letter to National Geographic. And then it plays that scene in the movie of, of Mia playing Robin writing the letter to National I Geographic. I really like that idea. It really brings a book to life. Yeah, and yet, I don't want yes. books to die because there's a, something about the, the, what, you know, that you get with the print that you could just stare at. Just like when I was a kid, you could just, you can just sit there and get sucked into it. And that's, you can't do that with digital for some reason. I want to hear something eerie. That book you're holding in your hands, the, they're selling, it, when it came out, I think it was $40. It, there's people selling this on Amazon for literally hundreds of dollars now. It's like, <laughs> no, no, it, it's bizarre. There's somebody I saw yesterday, $299. It's like, come on, really? Well, it's, it's out of print right now. That's why. Yeah. Uh, we actually, we had a quantity of books we just actually sent to Amazon this week. So hopefully it'll be, we're going to list, I want to make it affordable to people. I just want people to be inspired by Robin's journey. Right. Part of, you know, Part of the reason that this story has always fascinated people is that Robin, to this day, has never explained why she did the trip. It wasn't to get famous. It wasn't to write a book. It wasn't, obviously, to have a movie made about her. She actually wanted to get away from people. <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of ironic. The more she tried to get away from society, the more society has chased her all these years, <laughs> telling, saying, why? Why did you do the trip? Why? And, and she, uh, she, she still has camels, right? I mean, she's not... Uh, well, she doesn't now. I mean, oh, she doesn't? Oh, okay. Uh, I get the impression uh, she still loves camels. Maybe after... <laughs> Well, she even talks about that. She said the camels were the best way for somebody who had no money to travel in the outback back right. then. She couldn't afford a car. Now, she did love these animals. They were like her children. She says they're like eight-year-olds. Yeah. They're funny. They're impetuous. They're, <laughs> they loved her. They didn't like me very much. But they were one-person animals. Yeah. And they spit. Uh, they do. Yeah. They can be mean. And if any of your, I'm so saying, if any of your uh, listeners are in Hawaii, the movie's being shown at the Maui Film Festival. Oh. Um, early June, I think it's June fourth or sixth, or one of those two days at the at the Maui Film Festival. Great, we do have oh. view, uh, many viewers in Hawaii, yeah. and I can't wait. So it's coming out we're, uh, nationwide in September. September nineteenth. Very exciting. And if, if people are curious, her book Tracks has just been reissued by her publisher Random House, and uh, uh, from Alice to Ocean is obviously still available on Amazon. Don't buy the three hundred dollar version; <laughs> buy the twenty five dollar version. That we're going to put them up new for twenty five dollars. Good. So so you have a few in the back room. We do. What? So we. I want to wrap it up, but we talked yeah. at the beginning of the uh, interview a little bit about how the life of a photographer has changed. It's not as easy to make a living if you're not one of the top, top, top people. What do you? What do you feel the future of photography, as for a professional, is? I'm probably going to give you a different answer than the one you're expecting, which is that um, there's a little device I saw recently that takes a picture, you wear it around your neck like a little necklace. I forget what it's called. It's a narrative so clip, funny. and I have one. Narrative clip, thank you. Yes, okay. And uh, it takes a picture every 30 seconds or something yeah. like that, and you yeah. get to sort of see your life and fast forward still mm -hmm. frames. Mm -hmm. um, just the way that when the you know when we used to have 300 baud dial-up modems, if you'd said to somebody, how would you like to have the internet on 24 hours a day, you would have thought, I'll go broke. You know, it's my you know AOL charging you by the minute. Um, I think that we're going to start having, the, our clothes are going to have cameras built into them. That everything around us is going to be capturing images. And it, again, it's the curation of those images that's going to become the next skill. Uh, and it is a skill. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe there'll be a handful of the old kind of photographers around. But I think that I, I, the, and Cartier of Sun's idea of a decisive moment of the one frame that captures an mm -hmm. entire situation. I think that's so important. Uh, but again, I think curation and editing is going to become an incredibly important part of our way that we understand and see the world. Rick, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I had no idea that your wife was Elliot uh, Irwin's uh, daughter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I am going to, this print from the Family of Man is available from uh, Elliot as a uh, a print. I'm going to order it's it. Cause, gorgeous. Cause it's I, gorgeous. I, I, I'm going to have your sister-in-law's butt on my uh, wall. <laughs> because no, well, because it, me, it has such memories for me. Give me a call if you if you want one, and uh, we'll talk. Oh, I I I like to support photographers. I'll I'll Good. buy one. No, no, I mean, yeah, but let's talk. Well, we can wait. We can we can, we can work out. Off, off <laughs> the, have you used Google Glass? Speaking of the narrative clip, uh, you know what? I've worn it once or twice. Um, I, my wife has such an, an allergic uh, reaction to it. Anybody wearing them, she will not talk to. Uh, <laughs> I kind of she, share. Her. You know, point of it, view, it, actually. I'm fascinated by the technology, but the invasion, the fact that, like, you know, you don't know if someone's right. recording you or not because it's but, very easy to just 
this uh right. but the same thing with the narrative the clip it, it's still yeah it's, right you know so who would know right right so um i wore mine to the gym and i had and i suddenly thought i'm a creep i gotta take this thing off yeah you wouldn't want to go to the men's room wearing google glass yeah, right right um there's a lot of places where people assume that you're invading their privacy it's gonna be really interesting where i mean it it's interesting to me how Google deals with this perception of uh, either you know people either want to be have no problem being recorded or other people are really opposed to it. A friend of mine, AJ Jacobs, this wonderful writer, showed me a little gadget that fits on his cap last year. It did something very similar. That basically right. he would just tap it and it would record conversations. Right. Right. And he'd tell people he was doing it, and then he'd play back his day at the end of the day and sort of edit it. Um, what, I don't know who has, I don't have time to go through all this stuff, and that's that's the big issue. Yeah. Really, I mean, I have no trouble just trying to get through my day, little, and then playing the day back afterwards. I know, I know. Yeah. I don't <laughs> want to relive it, and I know my kids don't care. Uh, such a someday pleasure. They will. Yeah, someday maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, such a pleasure to talk again, uh, Rick Smolin. Uh, his many books uh, are uh, available at againstalloddsdotcom. Uh, I do recommend uh, for anybody, especially with kids around. Um, this is a great book to have the human face of uh, big data. Just so it's a it's 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 kind of stealth. It looks like oh it's just a picture book and oh it's pretty and then you kind of start to really understand a lot you get of sucked the stories. It's you amazing. Get sucked into it. You have uh, the thing that I said to our researchers when we were doing this is I want stories where people read it and say I've got to tell my sister or my mother yeah, or my kid yeah. my neighbor about this because I mean, every single story has that wow yeah. you just can't believe what's in yeah. here. You yeah, you got a picture of. The uh, guys who fly the drones, sitting in their in their little control room, which looks like a almost like a living room with screens. I mean, this is just amazing stuff. I also want to mention that this project was made possible by EMC and Cisco and SAP, but they gave us complete freedom to tell the story. They had no editorial input, no right of review. Uh, they just gave us the freedom to go out and, and actually. The, the idea here was to try to get the world thinking about big data because mm -hmm. I'm really worried that it's large companies and corporations and governments that understand the power of this, and most of us are not paying attention yet, right. and we need to be. You bet. Because uh, this is a new asset class. Our information is going to become one of the most valuable things that we produce as individuals. You've got essays from many people who've been, actually been on the show. Esther Dyson has an essay in here. Oh, Esther's great. Yeah, yeah, she's great. Um, and uh, is your father-in-law still around? Is he still alive? Yeah, he's, he's 86 years old, turning 86 in July, and... Uh, he has exhibits opening in Milan one day, Tokyo the next. He just shot the tourism campaign for the Puerto Rico. This guy is, I mean, I hope when I'm 86, I'm as active as no he kidding. is. He is so creative. And it's all new stuff. It's not just going back through his old uh, uh, archives. He does two books a year. Wow. And uh, amazing. So, you know, photography keeps you young. <laughs> yeah. And some, I mean, I'm just looking at the images on his site, and some of them, these are so iconic that you will never, I mean, you've seen them. You will never Nixon, Pope, Khrushchev in the chest. That one of the that is an book. amazing picture. Everybody's seen that picture. Yeah, uh, these are you know, pretty historical pictures. The kitchen debate. That's right. Hey, Rick. Thanks so much. I really thanks, appreciate Leo. your time, Rick Smolin. Take care. Againstalloddsdotcom. Thank you. We do triangulation you. every Monday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC. Please tune in and watch live. Uh, some of those great questions I had for Rick came from you in the chat room, so I really appreciate that. If you can't watch live on-demand versions, always available after the fact, audio or video at twit.tv slash T-R-I. Best, though, subscribe, and there's lots of ways to do it. Stitcher, iTunes, and, of course, our own wonderful Twit apps. There are a variety of them on all the major mobile platforms. That's a great way to listen. Uh, we thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Triangulation. Triangulation.